Hello and welcome to Season 3's penultimate episode of the Rogue Monkey Podcast. My name is Kevin Pickard and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. It's hard to believe that since January 2020 when we launched our first episode, the whole world has changed and many people's lives have been set on a different course. Ten months on and we've now got listeners in 45 countries tuning in and sharing their own stories through social media and email. I cannot tell you enough how nice it is to hear these stories of how our guest stories have inspired, helped and motivated you to take actions in your life. It's a very polarised and often negative world right now, so it's amazing to hear your positive stories. This week we have a really fascinating guest joining us and is one of the most perfect demonstrations of how challenge and convention can provide powerful change in the world. Professor Rosie Meek is a psychologist and specialises in research within prison systems. She's worked with the United Nations, as well as many other organisations, demonstrating the value of sport interventions in preventing youth crime and working in a wide range of prison settings using sport as a tool for good. Our discussion traverses both Rosie's journey from start to finish and then culminates in some incredibly powerful stories and messages for us to take away. I can openly say that I came away from both my first discussion with Rosie and the recording of the podcast feeling a lot more informed and balanced in my views. I hope you find the discussion interesting and make sure you listen right to the end as we give you a sneak preview to our season finale. So let's get into the penultimate show of season three of the Rogue Monkey podcast, Finding Your Place in the World, a discussion with Professor Rosie Meek about her journey and the power of sport and physical activity in changing lives. Hello, Rosie, and welcome to the show. How are you? Hello, I'm great. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for joining us today. I've given our listeners a little bit of an overview as to who you are and what you do. But if you can just give our listeners a little bit of an insight into your journey so far, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, Okay, well, I'm a professor of forensic psychology, and my interest in psychology originally came through a fairly unusual route. I was actually not intending to go to university. I was working with horses that was what I thought would be my career and I decided to do an evening class in psychology at my local college and really enjoyed it um I also did an evening class in maths a level and um just enjoyed the studying and realized at that stage that I could go to university this was still in the days when you got a full grant if uh, you were from a low-income family which I was and I was very thankful that Sussex University offered me a place despite my fairly unusual educational background Um, and the rest is history really. I did my my first degree in psychology, absolutely fell in love with the subject. Um, I think partly because it explains so much about the world and about us as humans. I'm quite a curious person and psychology provides some answers but also poses lots of other questions and um, I realised that I could uh, continue my my studies by by doing a master's and then ultimately a, a PhD. So when you went into obviously the the high levels of study, what were kind of the areas you focused in on? Because obviously many people when they go into specific subjects, when they get to kind of master's and then PhD level, it starts to kind of become a little bit more specific in the areas of their chosen subject they focus on. So how did that kind of pan out for you? Yeah, I think that's quite interesting because my route to focusing on criminal justice issues, um, prisons, working with offenders came through my involvement as a volunteer working in those sectors. Um, I'd worked um, before as a student and while I was a student as a volunteer with a couple of different charities, but in particular with the New Bridge, which is a charity working in criminal justice settings, supporting people in prison and preparing them for release. And so obviously that gave me a you know, direct insight into the experiences of people in prison, which previously I, I hadn't really um, obviously been aware of. Uh, and then I also volunteered with my local youth offending team in Brighton, which again gave me really valuable insight into working in the youth justice system. And because of that, I, I became increasingly determined that my PhD would would focus more on the real world, as it were. I wanted to, to get out and do some research, which I thought could 
could make some real difference and could re relate to a real world topic. And I was fortunate enough to be able to carry out my research in a young offenders institution, working with uh, young men in prison and following them in their transition from, from custody back to the community after they finished their prison sentence. So my PhD research was, was fairly longitudinal in that it was following a cohort of, of young men as they left prison. So I mean, a lot of different things for us to, to explore there. What specifically kind of when you look back on, on your PhD, did you think that was something that maybe I didn't anticipate? Or like you said, when you kind of first went in on a voluntary position, it maybe wasn't an area you'd specifically got experience in. So were there certain things you kind of came away from and now look back reflectively and think that was something really, really interesting that I learned from that? Yeah, I think for me, there was a, a couple of things that came out of my PhD research, which I wasn't necessarily anticipating, but which has really shaped my research focus, my research career ever since. Um, and, and part of that is around the importance of relationships and families. Part of my PhD work looked at the experiences of, of young men in prison who were fathers and, and how that shaped their identities and their attitudes towards offending or, or desisting from crime. And that still remains for me a really important area of work. And I'm, I'm still fortunate enough to be involved in research, looking at that subject area, along with other um, voluntary organisations who, who directly do um, work in, in that sector. And then I suppose the other thing which has, has shaped some of what we'll be talking about today was I recognised from, from spending a great deal of time in, in youth prisons and indeed adult prisons, was the importance of um, the prison gym. Uh, it's not something that you necessarily think a great deal about before you spend time in a prison, but through working in, in prison settings, I realised that the prison gym was a fairly unique environment in a prison in that it represents a space that both prisoners and prison staff often want to spend time in. It's, it's seen as a positive space often, not always, but often, and somewhere where people can at least temporarily maybe uh, imagine that they're not previous, they're not currently in, in prison custody. Um, and that really struck me as, as being quite powerful. And I think that's what sparked my early interest around in, around what's become really the, one of the primary areas of my subsequent research career. So if we talk a little bit about, I guess, what that kind of led on to, did, was there specific aspects to either sport or just physical activity in general that you felt actually served perhaps a much bigger role than perhaps people who are maybe just out in society and maybe haven't got experience of the, the criminal justice system and actually see sport per se for what it is on face value and perhaps don't see some of the deeper things that it can do? Yeah, I mean, I'm, it's, I'm really interested and I always have been in in prison uh, education and the transformative effects of prison education and also of prison health and, and how many people who end up in our prisons for a number of reasons tend to be of poorer health than people in the community. And prison sport and physical activity, I think, links very well with two of those separate agendas. Um, through my work and others' work, we, we've found that, that, that sport can be a, a really effective way of encouraging better psychological health as well as of course um, physical and, and and other forms of health and also it can be really powerful in terms of encouraging people to engage in, in education and training even if that's something they previously not considered um, we have to remember that, that many people in our prisons have had very negative experiences of formal education and there's a very high rate of of multiple exclusions from education before incarceration um, which often can lead people to be very um, nervous or, or, or negative in terms of their thoughts around ent entering education and, and, and sport I've found can be really effective in nurturing a more positive relationship with, with education. So if we talk specifically uh, maybe some examples or whether it was a particular case or study that you kind of worked on where you kind of bring that to life a little bit and kind of give us some examples of what that looks like for kind of a, a typical either young offender or, or adult inmate who's accessing sport or physical activity. Yeah, so a, maybe a good example would be some of the work I did with a with another charitable organisation called Prisoners Education Trust. 
Uh, and as the name suggests, they, they support and encourage education in prisons. And we worked together to produce a report called Fit for Release, which came out, we coincided the launch uh, around the same time as the London Olympics back in 2012. It feels like a very long time ago now. Um, but we wanted to use that opportunity to highlight the importance of sport in promoting education in prison and, and promoting desistance from crime and, and, and more positive outcomes for people both whilst they're in prison and when they were leaving prison um, and I mentioned the name fit for release because as a report that's that's free to download online if, if people are interested because we we drew on material where we, we were able to focus on on case studies of how people had used sport and physical activity while they're in prison to turn their lives around for the better um, examples of people who have become personal trainers whilst they were in prison and then being able to um, go into the, the sports and fitness sector as a, as a meaningful form of employment when they came out of prison or people who had started doing some some fairly low level education courses while they were in prison to do with sports or maybe sports science and then that had progressed into degree level and, and beyond and then other people who were able to use sport and physical activity in, in a really positive way to help them to manage that transition from being in prison to returning to the community, whether that be volunteering and coaching to become um, a, a support coach in, in their kids' football team in the community or, or actually doing um, more structured training as part of their own um, transition back to, the, back to the community. So I mentioned that example because I think that that helped us to to bring to a wider audience some of the unique aspects of, of sport and physical activity in prison that, that we felt um, could be used to, to, to better help people in that situation and their families. So there is obviously a lot wider ripples there than perhaps the the face value of both sport and physical activity that I'm sure the wider public are, are used to and probably know some of the maybe headline benefits, but I've never perhaps looked or even know about some of these things that go on behind the scenes. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So kind of fleshing this out, I get a little bit more to, than just the participants per se. Obviously, we actually met at a coaching conference and obviously coaches play a huge role both as a potential career path for some of these inmates, but also in terms of offering structure for people that come out and are engaging in sessions or whether they're assistant coaches or whatever it is. So what's kind of been your experience and some of the positive aspects that coaching brings to kind of this whole arena that you work in? Yeah, you mentioned the event that we met at and I was really delighted to be invited to speak at that event because I think for me it showed that the wider sports and physical activity and indeed in this context coaching sector was showing a real interest in working more in criminal justice settings. And I think that's a really positive move. Um, I like the fact that UK Coaching recognised that there would be obviously some challenges or sensitivities in terms of um, encouraging more coaches to come into prisons. And, and part of my work involved reflecting on some of the findings from my um, 2018 government review into sport and physical activity in prisons, which uh, is called a sporting chance. If, if people are keen, again, that's free to download online. Um, but for me, I think that the coaching element is really powerful because not only does it offer people the opportunity to to provide a much better link with the community, but it also gives people a, another um, form of, of aspiration or, or role model in terms of what a, a, a journey out of prison into into the coaching world might look like for an individual who who maybe previously hadn't even considered that as a as, a, as an actual um, route. Do you think um, as well, kind of, I guess I'll speak more from a naive perspective myself, but actually, you know, kind of growing up in a, a relatively kind of stable background where I didn't have any, you know, run-ins with the justice system at all. And actually, you know, coaching played a huge role in my life. So actually, I think, do you, or, or do you think in your experience so far, there's actually almost not necessarily a negative perception, but actually for a, a a significant chunk of the kind of sports world and population it's actually a world that they've never kind of actively either come across or engaged in because it's it's quite far removed perhaps from where a lot of the traditional sports kind of place themselves that's right and that's why for me I think we've been missing some really powerful opportunities we, we all know those of us who work in this sector how um powerful that relationship with a coach can be in terms of being a positive role model, a, a, an ally, a supportive figure. 
And that's precisely what many people who are in prison um, who don't have who don't have supportive figures of their own in, in the community are, are seeking. Um, and so with that coaching relationship, we can see some really transformative um, work going on. With that, of course, comes responsibility because um, the coaching relationship um, it can become really effective. But at the same time, participants who, who um, are in prison and, and are engaging with community coaches might then start to feel comfortable to open up about some of their the, the experiences that they've had. Remember that many people in prison have experienced multiple trauma um, and the coaches need to recognise that they, they might be dealing with, with some quite vulnerable individuals through this this. Um, albeit for a sporting context. Uh, and I think for coaches that might require a certain amount of um, stamina, sort of psychological stamina, um, in order to manage that. So I'm not saying it's for everyone, but I think that coaching relationship can be really transformative. And, and some of the work I've done has shown that actually it's the power, it's the quality of that coaching relationship, which is more significant in terms of the positive outcomes than the actual type of sport that's being engaged in. Do you think that whole narrative around how maybe coaching has actually evolved over the last kind of maybe 20 or 30 years, you know, where actually the, the word relationship in its much wider context is actually much better understood in terms of its importance and actually a lot more emphasis is placed on that, generally speaking. So obviously not going into this exact area that you work in, but actually coaches full stop have a much better understanding now than perhaps 20 or 30 years ago and the actual system is much more encouraging of positive relationship forming and you know emotional intelligence and working a a lot deeper in those areas than perhaps traditionally it did do you think that now means that prisoners that are hopefully working within these initiatives have a much better chance of then transitioning more functionally into society I do and I I think that increased awareness that that you've talked about is also a good thing overall Within the, within the coaching world because it's encouraging people to be more considerate about people's backgrounds and needs and sensitivities and, and, and the relationship rather than simply um, focusing on the, the actual sporting endeavour um, first and foremost. So I think that's, that's a positive shift um, that we've seen within the world of coaching. Do you think then actually in terms of, I guess, more wider society now, there's actually a much... I wouldn't necessarily say greater empathy, but there's a, a more uh, a wider level of empathy um, than perhaps there was quite a long time ago, purely because a lot more of these initiatives can actually come to light, whether that's through ambassadors or whether that's through you know TV programs or people that kind of cover this stuff. And I think when you watch, you know, whether it's someone like a Louis Theroux or someone like that going into various prisons, and actually you start to see a little bit more behind the scenes of what perhaps maybe you've traditionally been understanding is the prison system and um, you actually kind of appreciate I guess a lot more of the challenges and therefore certainly with my coaching hat on you can be a lot more empathetic to both what you can bring to the table what, what also it can do for that person who's in that situation. I, I like to think so yes and, and certainly in my own conversations um, I've experienced that um, in people wanting to offer their support and their ex- expertise in, into criminal justice settings, because ultimately we all benefit from from positive interventions that can reduce reoffending and reduce future victims of crime. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily as simple as that. In that, doing work in prisons in particular is it can be very challenging. Um, just getting into the prison in order to deliver coaching is, is a huge challenge in itself for, for ordinary community coaches um, so that there are obviously a whole set of barriers that need to be um, managed in terms of, of, of delivering coaching in, in prisons not least because although um, many people in prisons would be delighted to be receiving community coaching initiatives um, we have to work around a, a very structured regime of the prison um, and let's not forget there's also a fantastic workforce already working in our prisons in, in terms of what are called PE instructors or physical education instructors who are prison staff who have then undertaken additional training uh, in order to d- deliver a whole suite of of physical education or, or gym-based programs. So I always encourage community coaches also to work collaborative, collaboratively with with those people um so that can really ultimately bring the best impact in terms of um whatever that sporting based program might be 
So you mentioned their impact, kind of looking back on all your experiences and all the different projects you've been involved in. Have there been specific, um, not necessarily examples, obviously, from an anonymity point of view, but actually specific um, traits or things you can see that coaching and sport brings to the table that really allows these people to much better integrate into society when they come out? Yeah, there's, there's so much here. And this is one of the reasons I was inspired um, back in 2013 to, to write my book called Sport in Prison, which is, as, as the name suggests, dedicated to this topic. Because when I started doing work in this area about a decade ago, I, I discovered there was very little research and was somewhat surprised about that and, and, and set about in, in writing my book to 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 partly respond to that um, that gap in the literature and I'm pleased to say that that over the last five or ten years we we've seen um, much more good quality research on this topic and my own doctoral students have become the, the new generation of students focusing on on some of that work that I that I started ten years ago um, but yeah one of the reasons I think I've been so committed to to this subject area is that sport can can have impact on on many different elements of of the prison regime in the same way that um, music and the arts can actually as well. This isn't something that's necessarily unique to sport, but it's um, certainly a very effective hook in terms of engaging people who might be reluctant to engage in other programs. Uh, And as I've already discussed, it's a very powerful way of of promoting um, education and better health outcomes. For me, the sort of social psychological aspect of giving people an alternative identity to that of being an offender shouldn't be um, forgotten about. That's that's very powerful. And and I've had many, many people in prison tell me that sport offers them an alternative, something positive, something that they can aspire towards, which they think is meaningful, but also realistic. Um, And that's one of the reasons why it's always encouraging to hear real life stories of people who have used sport to, to turn their lives around. Um, people like John McAvoy, who, who has become a, become a friend and colleague who himself um, broke a number of world records on the rowing machine while he was serving a, a, a life prison sentence and has since his release really used that um, new identity for, for good. And he's now a, a Nike sponsored Uh, elite athlete and and dedicates a lot of his time to talking to people who who were who were in the same position as he was not very long ago so I I think that's one of the really um, incredible features of this work is is seeing how people can and will use sport and physical activity to to turn things around for the better Um, and those who work in this sector whether that's prison governors or or prison PE staff or people who work in the voluntary sector or indeed prisoners and ex-prisoners and their families um, are all very much on board with that. I'm curious when you talked um, a little bit there about kind of I guess like the new identity and the second chance and all those sorts of things how much um, and again it's quite a naive question but how much in terms of that sector is actually almost done on like preemptive work i.e you know looking at potentially vulnerable groups and actually using sport to almost avoid them ending up there in the first place is that something that's kind of um exploited i guess as much as it could be in terms of obviously there are, i'd imagine statistically some more vulnerable areas of the country and demographics where actually you can turn around and go if we did a sport intervention there we already know it works at the other end of the spectrum when we're taking people out of the prison system back into society but can we actually go into society first and actually almost stop that happening in the first place is that something that kind of goes on yeah, absolutely. And it's a really important point to raise this idea of early intervention or indeed diversion from the criminal justice system, because we absolutely know um, from a fairly young age that the children and young adults who are most at risk of becoming involved in, in the criminal justice system, those who are excluded from school, for example, and, and are showing um, behavioural issues at a young age, or indeed those who's, who's um, have family members who have been in prison who are uh, statistically much more likely to wind up in prison themselves. Um, so we do know those those young people that we should be targeting 
to help avoid them end up in, in the criminal justice system in the first place. And again, sport has been used really effectively in that way as a way of engaging people, as a way of offering them an alternative. I certainly would like to see more of that. Um, but I'm, I'm currently working on a number of initiatives that are looking specifically at that in term, from from the mayor's office through to the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. Uh, you know, there is widespread recognition that, that sport has a really important role to play here. Um, but it's all about resource, of course. Um, and unfortunately, we're more likely to see um, the resource having to go to later on in the criminal justice system when people have already wound up in prison, because that is an incredibly expensive um, resource to have to, to commit to. So, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think we could be doing more in terms of diversion or, or early intervention. Um, and that is where some of the work that, that youth offending teams are doing and the Youth Justice Board. Um, I'm currently involved in a new initiative called Leveling the Playing Field, um, which is supported by the London Marathon Charitable Trust um, and the Alliance of Sport and, and the Youth Justice Board. So I'm, I'm pleased that this is certainly growing in terms of people's recognition of, of the importance of sport in this area. Yeah, and I think like if you if you take like the the health crisis in terms of obesity, for example, the, the you know the mindset is invest more in physical activity so that those people longer term don't then become a financial burden on the NHS. Whereas actually, sport <clears throat> has kind of taken that approach from a health point of view, but actually looking at kind of a wider society, actually then saying, well, what other areas of society can we offer value, um, especially in like these kind of diversion kind of um, projects where actually it it solves the problem before it starts if that makes sense that's right and and it's um telling that you mentioned that you, you used the word value there because that's something that as researchers we're starting to focus a bit more on in terms of the social return on investment and, and the the financial and the economic value that can be placed on investing um, in sports-based initiatives and, and I have been doing some work with UEFA who are keen to start to um, develop a more um, useful tool along those lines so it's it's something that people recognize if we can demonstrate the value of these initiatives and then, then we have a stronger case for for seeking resource and that's only right I think we're, we're living in a time of, of very limited public funds and we need to know where best to to target those limited funds in terms of having the best impact yeah definitely and I think also it's um it's a lot easier when you, okay I'm plucking numbers out of the air but let's say you you know you're asking a government department or a charity or a sports organization for a million pounds to run a project and the answer is no and then you say well actually it's going to save 10 million pounds further down the line mm-hmm. you know suddenly it's a much more common sense case to say well of course we don't want to be investing 10 million pounds in five years time or 10 years time when you know the social impact negatively is kind of materialized we're actually going about it the preemptive way so I think that would be an interesting shift in kind of the way that that funding is handed out as more and more of that becomes apparent because like you say we are in a time of very scarce resources and you know based on the last few months I think those resources are going to become even more squeezed so value for money is something that is obviously going to be a good thing. Yeah, it definitely is. And I think that's the role of academics has become more important here as well in terms of um, helping organisations to demonstrate and articulate the, the impact of their work um, so that they can make a stronger case for, for resource investment. So kind of in this area, obviously, you've got a huge amount of experience in it. When you look back across the, the journey you've been on, but also some of the people that you've kind of crossed paths with on the way, what have been kind of the the learning so far that you perhaps pass on to your students and all these other people that are kind of picking up the baton I guess to actually kind of take forward into the next generation of people that are supporting this area? I think that's a really good point and it's something we need to to constantly ask ourselves because especially with criminal justice issues and policing and prisons everyone has a, an opinion on that and sometimes those opinions are not really founded in reality. Sometimes they're founded on on fear or, or indeed on, on media representations. And you mentioned my students. One of the parts of my role I, I, I enjoy the most is, is my teaching. And um, at least until recently, I was able to take my students into the prisons that I work in and, and share with them some of my research and, and get their insights. And, and then I have incredible pride when I see my students go on and and start making a real difference in the world and, and 
and carving out their own journeys um, in terms of particularly those that focus on uh, social justice or, or, or criminal justice issues. Um, I suppose the things I try and relay to my students is that um, we should never underestimate people or, or give up on people. Um, it's very easy for us psychologically to think, right, there are 80 odd thousand people in prison at the moment. They, they're all bad people. They've done something wrong. Let's just forget all about them and, and um, throw away the key, as it were. And there is a lot of people who do have that agenda or, or that um, attitude. Um, but I, I think my my core belief is that there, there is good in, in everyone and, and many people in prison um, could and want to turn their lives around for the better and they may need a certain amount of support in order to do so and they may indeed need some second chances as it were um, but one way in which I've been so um, enthused by the role of sport and physical activity is it can be incredibly um, leveling it can be an opportunity for people to to pull on a pair of boots or, or whatever it is they're doing go for a go for a park run um, or, or go and do some volunteer coaching and actually um, show the world that they can do something good and positive um, and I think that's that's really important to remember that it, it's it's all too easy to give up on people and, and um, sport is one way I think where we are often reminded that that people have a lot to give and they have a lot to to develop into and, and, and sport can be a great way of, of facilitating that you talked there a little bit i guess around that kind of it is quite a polarized view of that people are either you know they're in prison and they're bad or they're not in prison and they're good and actually like mm. that can that can be quite exacerbated i guess by the the social media world that we all find ourselves in but do you think kind of through this kind of education process not just specifically in terms of your students but actually the the wider rhetoric and when things make it onto tv and in mainstream media that are kind of the positive aspects to some of these these journeys that you're all going on is that something that you feel like is starting to change that narrative a little bit i do hope so and i think i mean i certainly believe that and that's why i commit so much of my time to um, engaging with with audiences who wouldn't necessarily normally hear about my research in academic circles or who wouldn't normally have direct experience of going into a prison and experiencing firsthand some of the, the issues that I'm talking about and you know I genuinely believe that that people can be quite sympathetic and understanding if, if they understand if they get an insight into the full story. Um, I remember many years ago taking a community rugby team into a into a youth prison in order to play a game of rugby and was really struck by the conversations that, that we had on the, on the bus on the way home about how shocked these, these young men were that the, the men they were playing against in the prison were so much like them they had they had more in common than than, than not and that was something they were surprised by and um, humbled by and that that's just one anecdote which kind of gives an example of how sport can be a great way of reminding us of what we have in common with each other that's not to say I've got this rose-tinted view that, that you start playing a game of football and then suddenly everyone's going to get on well um, and indeed there are ways that sport can be used um, in, in terms of increasing um, inequalities but I think when used um, when used effectively that that's one of the most powerful tools there is in terms of um, encouraging people to be to be sympathetic or empathetic to to other human beings so if we talk you, you mentioned there a little bit about the the fact that you know when a team of rugby players have suddenly met a, a, a group behind bars do you, and they've actually found you know there's only a, a few things different if anything um from a i guess a, a research background what is it that often um starts people on these paths down to ending up in the prison system or is it a specific number of decisions or life events or is there generally patterns that emerge on these sorts of things because i think the reason i ask that is because we we as coaches and i think if you watch you know any of your reality tv shows where they've got sportsmen on there can often trace it back to somebody relatively <laughs> early on in their journey that said the right thing at the right time so i think just yeah I'd, I'd just be curious to know really in terms of research what there is and what it says about that sort of thing in terms of people that end up in the system at the moment 
Yeah, I think that's really interesting having that parallel with with sports and sporting people, because just also as a side note, you know, as many of our our most loved sporting figures have had a slightly checkered past or indeed have attributed their involvement with sport as keeping them on, on the straight and narrow. And so we have no no shortage of sort of role models for our uh, particularly our young men in prison in terms of using sport to turn lives around. Um, but going back to, to your the core of your question about kind of uh, reasons that people end up in prison. I, I suppose let, let's be clear, there are some some very dangerous and violent people for whom prison is the, the best place for them. Um, I don't want to give a, an unrealistic picture. But at the same time, there are also a lot of people in prison. And I include many of the women and girls I work with in prison here who have been convicted of, of, of non-violent offences um, or when, when we look at their actual uh, life trajectory prior to prison we can see a whole catalogue of uh, traumatic experiences much much more likely to have experienced neglect or abuse as a child much more likely to have experienced time in in the care system as a child much more likely to have been permanently excluded from school as a child and and and, and once we start looking at these patterns of, of early childhood adverse experiences um, you can start to have a little bit more understanding about how people have, have wound up in the prison system and, and how uh, the odds have been against them, if you like, from, from quite a young young age. As I said, I'm, I'm not excusing um, behaviour that might have led to people serving their custodial sentence, but it, at least I think it provides a little bit of context for how people have have wound up on the journey that they've been on. Um, and often I remind coaches when, when I take people into prison, we're not interested in that point at in their past and what they've what bad things they've done um all too often people in prison are judged on you know the worst thing they've ever done in their life um whereas one of the things i think many people love about sport is it's uh, it, it can be as i already said a, a very leveling experience and an opportunity for someone to to have another go at demonstrating what they can contribute to their community or, or to society yeah, and I think also you talked there a little bit about or mentioned earlier about role models. You know, I think almost it carries a much more powerful message when somebody makes it to either the top in their sport or they're with a team that are really successful. And then a group of young people hear, you know, an interview that says, I could have made some bad choices or I did make some bad choices. Here's how I corrected it. I worked in sport. I worked hard. You know, all the kind of things that potentially young people who are sitting on the fence on some of these journeys could really do with hearing. And actually... That, that does, like you said, it becomes a really powerful thing and a role model that actually long term then hopefully stops more young people ending up in the same situation. That's right. And I have been involved in some some fantastic programs that have really had that idea at the heart of their delivery so that they will train up um, and employ ex-prisoners to be the coaches that will then engage with um, younger people who are maybe at, at risk of becoming involved in the criminal justice system. And that's not so that they can uh, glorify their experiences in any way, but so that they can um, identify um, with those younger people and, and identify with their experiences and, and and also show an alternative in terms of a, a route out of um, a, a criminal justice system or, or, or a or, or negative situation, which people might not realise as an alternative to once they're, once they're in the middle of it all. There's something I'd like to ask, I guess, because you've had such a, a diverse journey in terms of all these different experiences, and I'm sure in, in, in different parts of the country. If you could go back to, you know, just, you know, you're still back in, in your horse world, and actually you're kind of <laughs> potentially embarking on a new journey elsewhere in psychology, what would you have said to yourself kind of going back now that you think perhaps young people who are, you know, just kind of finding their place in the world would have been really useful to actually hear? <laughs> That's a great question um, and probably one that I would need to, to dwell on a bit. But I suppose when I think about my own journey and it was, you know, not, not a traditional route, um, it, it makes me realise, I think, that it, it's it's unrealistic for us to expect our our undergraduates or even our GCSE or our A-level students to have a clear view about what they want to do in the world. And, and that, you know, I was I was uh, that was never even on my radar that I could become a. a a psychologist or a professor, um, just so beyond the, the, the realms of, of what I might do with my life. And actually, it's not until you get the chance to um, to, to 
try out experiences and, and to be shown opportunities that, that you know it's up to an individual to take those opportunities for sure but I um I I, I often reflect back on that and, and realize that the, the, I hope my other my students are, are getting the opportunity to explore different ways that they might contribute to the world um because although you know I that, for me, once I once I meet my undergraduate students, they've already at least made a decision. They want to, to go to university and, and, and study psychology or criminology or law. Um, it, it Once they're at university, that's, I think, the, the, the really valuable time for them to, to, to really widen their, their horizons and, and not just academically, but also in terms you know, psychologically in terms of what might be their next steps. I really like that. And I think... I reflect back and I know we spoke when we were preparing for the call about how, you know, the conference we met at was 14 months ago and, you know, what's happened in the last 14 months and that seems like an age. But I think mm. I think it's a really powerful thing in sport to, to come across, I guess, perhaps some of the less well-known aspects to it, but, you know, hugely valuable um, and, to be honest, even more valuable than often a lot of the cheering and shouting we have around the success in certain, like, professional leagues and things like that. Well, actually, you know, some of these projects that probably don't get the the coverage or just general awareness that people could have about them do bring a huge amount. So that was kind of, it was really nice to mm. just kind of pick this discussion up. And actually, I remember having it at the conference thinking, I have never come across anyone involved in prison sport before. And I'd love to explore that a little bit further. So <laughs> it's been, um, it's been really, really interesting. It's, yeah, it's been a real pleasure to, to be able to share some of my experiences and, and insights so thank you for inviting me oh, really enjoyed it well thank you very much for your time and as i say we'll make sure we include the couple of documents you mentioned around sporting chance and fit for release in the the show notes and um Great. Thank, thank you very much for your time today oh it's a pleasure Wow, what a discussion. Thank you, Rosie, for sharing your insights into this perhaps lesser known area of sport and physical activity and its impact. Ultimately, young people cannot always control the cards they are dealt, particularly in the absence of parents. However, programmes like the ones Rosie's mentioned and the incredible work of coaches and supporting organisations to change the life trajectories for these people is truly amazing. In the show notes, I've included both a video and document link to give you an idea of the work that Rosie does. The second branch of the discussion for me was hearing about Rosie's journey herself. How many people know exactly what they want to do at 16 or 18 or even 21? The discussion today, I hope, gives people listening the confidence to say, it doesn't matter how old I am or what my background is. I find this area fascinating and want to forge a career working there. And why not? Picking up on that theme, we look ahead to the season three finale. And let's picture the scene. You're a seven-year-old growing up in London in the 1980s. Your heritage is from a mum in England and a dad from Colombia, and you have a chance visit to see your extended family. Your mum is terrified, and you are sitting in this tiny little propeller plane flying out into the wilderness. But as a wide-eyed child, you think, wow, look at that view. This feels amazing. I want to do this someday as a job. Now, no one in your family has ever been a pilot before. So what does that journey even look like? Fast forward a few years, and you not only achieve that dream, but you get to inspire thousands, if not millions of people in your incredible role. For the finale to season three, we are talking to David Montenegro, commanding officer for the Red Arrows. And yes, I can assure you the story is as awesome as it sounds. Hopefully, you'll join us next week. But until then, thanks for listening to the Rogue Monkey Podcast.